just recently I was asked to write a little blurb for a book that a friend is publishing. And so, of course, first thing I had to do was read the book. And uh, it's not even out yet, but it's, it's on its way soon. It's entitled, Let Me Tell You a Story. And, uh, and, it, and it's a story that eventually gets around to the author's life, Frank McMean. And he tells about an elementary school teacher who retired and now she's in her 80s. And she walks onto a Chevrolet dealership and she walks up to a big guy who everybody in town knows him and calls him Wimpy. That's his name. That's what he goes by. And so she walks up and she says, Wimpy, I want to buy a car. And he said, today? And, and she said, yes, I want to buy a car. He said, okay, Miss, Miss Sue, which, which car do you want to buy? And she hasn't thought about that. She knows nothing about cars. And so she just looks at the car in front of her and he, she points and says, that one right there. And he says, that one? And she says, yes, but I want to take it on a test drive. And he said, look, we've got a lot of cars on the lot. You sure you want this one? And she said, this is the one, but I want a test drive. He says, okay. So they get in their vehicle, in this test drive vehicle, and they, they, it's in Columbia, Tennessee, and they're heading down Lawrenceburg Highway. And she comes to a field and she turns the car off the road and drives into the field, cuts off the engine and says, Wimpy, I've been wanting to talk with you. Everybody in town knows you. Everybody in town loves you. She said, as a matter of fact, when you die, there won't be a building in town large enough to hold the crowd that will come to your funeral. Now listen, Wimpy, you have a wonderful wife and a wonderful child. That child and that wife, they deserve a Christian father and a Christian husband. And so Wimpy, I want to tell you about what Jesus has done for me. And she sat out in that field and she told him how Jesus had impacted her life. And here's this 80 year old woman. And by the time she's finished, Wimpy has tears coming into his eyes. And, and Wimpy says, Miss Sue, you really didn't want to buy a car today, did you? And as she says, well, actually, no, I don't need a car and I didn't want to buy a car, but I knew I had to get an opportunity where nothing would distract you. And I could just tell you about Jesus who loves you so much. But she said, I'll tell you what I am going to do. I'm going to be honest and I am going to buy this car today, but I wanted to also tell you about Jesus. And so she went back, she bought the car. And Wimpy became a Christian. And so Frank McMean, the author of this book, says a few years later, Wimpy, who was also into horses, comes to my father's barn, and his father was a trainer of horses, and pulls into the driveway and says, and, and this is Frank Jr. telling the story. His father was Frank Sr. Wimpy drives up, gets out of his car, walks into the barn, and says, Frank, We've known each other a long time. We've done a lot of horse deals together. We think highly of each other. But tonight I've come to this barn because I had to tell you a story about Miss Sue. And the day that she came onto the dealership parking lot and she bought a car just to be able to tell me about Jesus. And today I'm here because I know that you have a wonderful wife and a wonderful son. And they deserve to have a Christian father and a Christian husband. And so I want to tell you how Jesus has impacted my life. And that night, Frank's father was baptized into Christ. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> it's so neat. It's just a reminder of when people love the Lord and they love others and they live in view of eternity, how it puts everything important into perspective. It does. And, then, and so tell us who you are, your name, where you're from, and, and uh, an interesting fact. All right. I'm David Shannon, and I live in Henderson, Tennessee, and I'm president of Fried Hardeman University. And Fried Hardeman is a Christian college, and we have just wonderful young people, most from the United States, but some from around the world also. And we have a good time serving God together and also striving for academics in 
in excellence in academics. And so I have a wife, 32 years and five children, six grandchildren. Since I was a teenager, I've preached. I love, I love telling the story of Jesus. And, and when, when you told me that story of the horse, I thought the guy was going to walk in and say, I'd like to buy a horse. <laughs> That's not what I thought too. But, but isn't it neat? Because he just reused the story, which tells us we, we don't, it doesn't always have to be personal to be effective. You know, right. you know the, the story of Miss Sue would work for a lot of us to walk up to somebody, you know, to share that story to. Yeah, I was thinking like, I was going to make that as point one. You don't have to be personal to be effective. Cause yeah. that's a, so we'll go into the strategies area now, which is where the, the meat of the show. And like, what do you think is some good strategies that worked for you or that you've heard for personal evangelism? Things that people can do, you know, practical things. Yes. And can I begin by saying, I realized that, you know, we could bring together a hundred Christians and they all could share their practical approaches. And there might not be a lot of, duplicates in, in ideas and opinions. And so I just want to begin by saying, I don't think that what I'm about to share is like the best or the preferred way. But when you ask, I have to go back to a time when I was about 25 years old and a preacher was speaking to a group of young preachers and he urged every one of us to set aside time every week for individuals. Mm. And his whole deal was you can't reach people with the gospel if you don't have time for individuals. And, and so I left that meeting. And as a matter of fact, I was so convicted that I asked for his phone number and if I could set up a phone appointment with him. And, and a week or so later, we spent over an hour on the phone. And I just had a lot of questions because I really wanted to learn because he was very, very effective in sharing the gospel. He was very effective. And so I wanted to learn from him. And, and so out of learning from him, what I did was I set aside for many, many years, for example, Tuesday afternoon and evenings. Hmm. And, and any time, if I was at the grocery store or if I was at, you know, the foyer of the church building and, and I was interacting with someone who was not a Christian, I would oftentimes just say to them, hey, let me throw out something that, you know, you may not be ready for right now or you may be, but for whenever it is down the road, just, I want you to know something. I love to just sit down and open the Bible and just study together. And, and, and I love to do it with just individuals where it's just like one or two or three of us in a room. And, and we just spend an hour together and learn whatever we can learn. And if that ever interests you, like if, if you want to just study together, or maybe, maybe you're thinking, I don't know anything about the Bible. Well, we'll just start, we'll just start, start on a real elementary level and, and we'll just go from there. You know, what was interesting was how almost every time people would say, oh, okay. Like, you know, almost like a deer in the headlights look like, and, and, but yet I could also see some interest oftentimes, but you know, people are, are afraid to use your time. So what I would, I would go back and remind them. I would say, Hey, look, for example, I usually do this every Tuesday afternoon or even Tuesday evenings. So like, listen, if it's not with you, I'm, I'm going to be with like two or three different individuals this coming Tuesday. And invariably they would say, oh, you mean like you do this with others too? And I'm like, yeah, every week. Like I sat down with individuals every week like that. And, and if they didn't say yes, then so oftentimes they would come back around. I remember one, one, one day I was standing in the foyer of the church building and a girl walked up. I had not seen in a while. And uh, it's a young woman. She was, she was probably in her mid twenties. And, and she walked up to me and she, she said, Hey, and I said, well, Hey, how you doing? She said, fine. She said, I'm ready. And like, I hadn't seen her in a year. And, and I said, okay. And you know how you try to play along to, to get the context. And so I tried to play along for like 30 seconds or a minute. And finally I just had to face up, you know, and I was, and I was like, Hey, I really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and she said, you remember about a year ago, you said, anytime you want to study the Bible, just whenever you're ready, let me know. And, and she said, I'm just telling you now I'm ready. And I said, great. I said, what about Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday evening? And, and we began studying and just had a great study. And so I, you know, I know as a preacher in a way that's a little bit easier to do because people 
know you from, they, they see you preach or they see you around town. But, you know, I grew up in a family where, you know, my mom and dad, you know, they weren't in full-time ministry. And yet my mom and dad were regularly in people's homes studying the Bible with them. But it was because there were always going to be invitations extended. And so I would, I would point out, number one, everybody ought to have a block of time that they, that they on their, their own mental calendar that says, I'm going to keep this time available. So that then number two, when feel free to just often and randomly throw out invitations just to sit down and, and study about Jesus. But then the neat thing is, if you put those two together, you never know. I mean, you literally never know when, when either that opportunity to invite is going to come and someone says yes, or they circle back around a year later and, and say, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. And, and then figure out what works best for you in a Bible study. The third thing I would say is there's not one magical method of sharing the gospel of Jesus. Now, we do know the Lord gives us two huge priorities, and that is truth and love. And so it, whatever we share, whatever the method is, it has to be truth and love. But, but I'm saying that to say this, when you do figure out whatever method you like, try your best to become really good at it. You know, you don't have to be good at everybody else's method, but at least have one method that you're really comfortable setting down and sharing Jesus. Well, that's awesome because, and you know, when you said truth and love, people, uh, when someone approaches you in love and it's authentic, they can make a lot of mistakes and you're happy. Yes. Yes. That's so, so right. And, and truth without love, it, it does damage. It it's almost comes off as arrogance. Humility is truth with love. Truth without love is arrogance, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Yes. And, and people always want to take someone high and put them low, <laughs> but they want to lift up people who are low higher. And that's, that's a cool thing about, you know, even you're a Christian or not in this, in the world we live in, a lot of people like to lift up those who are humble, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, I know when we say truth and love, when we really stop and think about it, you know, the Lord talks to us about love in three directions, love for him, love for others and love for ourselves. And so when we think about truth and love, that love should be in all three directions. But think especially toward that other person, it's, it is easier to be humble toward them if we really love them. And, you know, like I, I always try to be really mindful of not embarrassing them and, and, um, just making them feel real comfortable and, you know, and, and you say, oh, is that part of the method? Well, that's just kind of part of love, <laughs> you know? And so it's beautiful how much falls under truth and love. I, I love it because it, it, humility never goes wrong. Jesus was humbled himself. He could have been a prince. He could have been a ruler of you know, all these things and all this money. But he came in, he talked to everybody around him. So that's, this is exactly in line with how Jesus did his, his ministry. Yes. Sure. And also we, the other day, like we were out um, shooting some video for doing some evangelism. And uh, we're like, we, we don't know what we're doing. So we just tell people that. <laughs> You know, instead of being so, they are more comfortable with you if you, if you admit that I, I'm just like you, you know, I, I'm not, a, I don't have it all together and then, the, and then they can loosen up. But if you think they think you're professional and you know what's going on, you're so like on top of things and they're like, whoa, I don't know. It's kind of intimidating. <laughs> right. Right. And you know, the, the one thing I tried to kind of make sure that I come across as being like really together on is, is my desire to do whatever God's will is. Right. You know, and, and it was neat how people would, would that, that was kind of the culture of the study, you know, was, was hopefully love was a part of that culture, but, but it was also, a, Hey, I just really want to find what God's will is and, and take the next step toward it. And, and when I'm studying with people, I just hope you're learning whatever God's will is for you and that you have a heart that says, I'm willing to take that step toward him. And so in that, then, like you say, we, we kind of have permission to, Hey, we don't have all the answers, but the neat thing is we know the one we're wanting to please and the one we love and the one who loves us. And yeah, so that, I think that's important. Well, we know the truth, right? The, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So it's really cool to have that confidence to know we know the way 
we know the truth and we know the life. It's not us because we'll mess it up. Yeah. If you're selling yourself, it, it, everybody who's listening and watching, if you're selling yourself to, to, to make Christians, probably not going to make too many Christians. If you give Jesus and you love like Jesus, you're going to, he says, if I am lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. And I think that's the key. We lift Jesus up. Yes. Hey, you know, I kind of, along those lines, I, I kind of have a little rule for myself that I try really hard when, when we're in the midst of a Bible study and, and someone says, you know, well, what do you think about, or, and sometimes they'll even like, well, you know, the church you're part of, what do they think? And, and I try real hard to never answer those questions. And, and, uh, it's so there was this husband and wife that I, we studied together on Tuesday afternoons for months. And, and they had a lot of questions and really just a lot of conflict going on in their life. And, and we studied a lot of months and I mean, months and months later, they, they were eventually baptized into Christ. They were sitting in a Sunday morning Bible class at church. And, and, and I just so happened to be teaching that class and, and someone asked a question in class, something about, you know, what do you think, whatever, and she spoke up. And she said, she said, I can tell you this. I've asked that guy this that question many times. And I can tell you right now what he's going to say. Let's just see what God says about that. Because it really doesn't matter what I think about it. And, you know, sometimes I, I say to people, look, just because I believe something, I mean, it won't help us get to heaven. But if the Lord says it and we believe it, that's what matters. That's, that's the power right there. Yeah. Following, following, that's what Jesus said. Follow him. He didn't say, watch him. Hey, isn't it amazing what you just said? Isn't it amazing how many times that was Jesus is simple directed. Hmm. I mean, it's really amazing when you start looking through scripture, how many times he, he said to people, follow me. We need to hear that, you know, in, in our hearts. And, and we do because he knows where he's going. <laughs> yes. And no, not, he's really awesome. That's right. Well, we don't, no one ever knows where they're going. If we want to be honest with ourselves uh, before Jesus, before God sent his son, no, 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 one's, people are wandering around, you know, like well, just aimless. Now we have a purpose. Let's go into the part of the show that has another story because we love stories. So I'll recap real quick what we talked about. So it does not have to be personal to be effective. Like the story you told it, it, that was a great story. It was not about you, but it was something that really helped people come in line with the idea of love and then uh, set aside time. I love that for individuals. I think when you have it, you'll fill it up. Everybody who has a garage probably fills it up. You don't have a garage, you don't fill it up. <laughs> yes. And then, and then often and randomly um, t invite people. So it's not once you have something to fill up, you got to fill it up. So you got you're out there, you got to fill it up this week. And then uh, I like the one thing: there's not a magic method for sharing the gospel. If you open your mouth, that's the method. <laughs> Whatever you can do. <laughs> so yes. let's get it to the the next story. Okay, my mother. I don't know how many people she shared the gospel with. I, I meet people, you know, that they will say to me, 40 years ago, your mother taught me, you know, it's just so neat. My mom now is almost 80 years old and m mom and dad lived always out in the country. And so, you know, we're talking about rural America where a lot of people would say, well, you know, I'd share the gospel, but, but you know, I'm, there's not many neighbors around me, you know? And so, and, and where, where I grew up, everybody's farm was called a place. And I don't know if you're accustomed to that terminology, but I, but just think about this as I say this, I was just randomly one night talking on the phone to my, to my parents. And this just a few years ago. And, and I said, well, what's happening in Brushy? That's a little community. I grew up in Brushy. And mom said, well, a, a lady from California just bought Bobby Bright's place. And like Bobby had lived on that farm since before I was born. So that's a big deal. You know, it's like, it's not like in the city where houses change, you know, we're talking about farms that are owned for generations. And so that's a big deal. And I thought, and I thought to myself first, wow, that's a big deal. But then second, it actually went through my mind. I wonder how long it will be before those people are invited to learn more about Jesus. <laughs> and, and so, but I didn't say anything because they were talking about, you know, when they moved into town and, you know, California is several thousand miles away from Tennessee and it's a big move. And like, you know, why did they move from California all the way to this small place in Tennessee? And 
And probably, I don't know, say two or three months later, I'm just, again, just doing a regular checkup, you know, my parents, you know, and, and I call and mom answers the phone. And you know how, when you know somebody real well, you can tell when, when something's like a little bit distracted from just the, Hey, how you doing? You know? And, and so we talk for like 15 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe just pleasantries real quick. And then she said, Dave, can I call you back later on this afternoon? Said my neighbor from, from next door, that bought Bobby Bryant place. We're just here at the dining room table and we've got our Bibles open and we're just having the best time. Can, can I call you back a little bit later? And I mean, I hung up the phone and I was just, I was thinking, well, there's my answer. <laughs> it's only going to take that long. Uh, you know, but again, it's, it's just that intentionality, you know, that, that says, Hey, if I see you and the Lord puts you in my life and you don't know the Lord, I just need to be looking for the opportunities to, you know, the conversations are good because they start building the relationship. And then when you build the relationship, you can have enough trust that when you do offer that invitation of, well, why don't we just sit out and, and why don't we study a little bit? That's what will then lead people oftentimes to say, well, sure, let's do it. And it doesn't matter how far away they are. They could be an, you know, acres away or feet away. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. And that, that uh, her neighbor, it, it was several months, but uh, several months later, she was, she was baptized into Christ. That's just, one at a time, man. One at a time. Yeah. I, you know, in that same little community, there was another man and woman that moved in from again, several thousand miles away. And uh, I won't, I won't give you the details, but mom and dad really became good friends with them and very intentionally shared the gospel with them. And I thought it's so neat because when he was baptized into Christ afterwards, my mom went up and gave him a hug. And, and as, as they were embracing, she said, I've prayed for you every day for four years and you just don't know how much I'm rejoicing. Wow. And you know, it's, it's just that it's, it's got, we have to love people. We have to love the Lord, but it has to be in view of eternity. You know, if, if eternity is not real, big deal about the gospel. Yeah. But if it's real, it's a big deal. That's, and it rhymes. If it's real, it's a big deal. <laughs> Don't forget that from this. <laughs> well, and, that, and you, you brought up a point real quick. Those of you listening, start praying now. I mean, you might be scared, you might be shy um, about the Bible study, um, but you, you don't have to be shy or scared to pray. And so start with that step first today. You know, you can do that. And that goes to the call to action. We'll come right into the call to action. So we have heard some great stories. These stories should be us on some level. You know, we should, we, at the end of our life, I want to be able to say that I've talked to people about Jesus. I mean, isn't that why we're here? Yeah. So tell us, David, um, if you, if you were to encourage people, like you've told some stories, you've got some strategies, how would you send people off? You know, this is the last few minutes of the show. What would you say? Here, here's what I would do. And we'll try to cover it from different angles. Like you were talking about, maybe for somebody who is kind of so new at this, they're just thinking, I want to put my toe in the water, but I'm scared. I don't want to. So how about let's do this. Let's go back over and say, first thing you do is find a time in your week. That, that you have in your mind to say, I'm, I'm going to block this time and I'm going to make sure that I'm available for other people. And then number two, you know, your invitation, if, if it may be as simple, but yet as powerful as saying, Hey, where, where I go to church, I just love it. Well, why don't you come worship with us sometime? I'd love for you to sit with me. And maybe that's what, or maybe, maybe there's a particular Bible study in your church or maybe in, in among Christians. And maybe you say, you know, we do this Tuesday night study, we do this Wednesday night study. And listen, I'd love for you to join me sometime. But what it does, even if they say no, and they, they very likely will the first time, but what you've done is you've planted a seed in their heart that they know you care about them. And if they start having a, a time in their life where they're wanting to know more about the Lord, they're going to naturally reach back to you because you've already planted that seed. It's kind of like maybe their window's not open right now, but you planted the seed so that when they're, that they become that window of opportunity, they're going to reach through that towards you. Now, maybe, maybe you're really comfortable saying, 
hey, I'd love to let's study sometime. And, you know, I give both of those invitations. You know, there's some people, I don't know them well enough. The trust isn't built up enough. And so I'm just then going to say, I'm going to talk about where I go to church. I love it. Why don't you come join us? But others, once the relationship is built up a little bit, I'd love for you, you know, let's just sit down sometime whenever you're ready. I always have said, you know, I'm not, I don't want to twist your arm. I'm not trying to twist your arm. I'm just saying whenever you're ready. And, and then also think about, Another really, really powerful invitation to, to use your time you've set aside is look around and see who is visiting at church on Sunday. And if they're a guest there, what about using your block of time to say, I'm always going to leave Sunday lunch open and we're going to invite whoever's at church. And, you know, it, it can be this simple. Hey, listen. We're so glad that you're visiting today, and we'd just like to get to know you a little better. We're going to run down to this little local restaurant down here, and we would love for you to join us. And if today's not good, we, we can do it next week or whenever's good for you, but we just love to get to know you a little better. It, here's something I think is real important for us to remember. In a lot of the churches we attend, the next baptism that takes place, you just watch and see. It's going to be somebody that has already visited your congregation. People... When they visit, they are showing that they are willing to put effort into searching. They're, they're already searching for something or they'd still be laying in bed on Sunday morning. You know, there's, there's a reason they got up and they got dressed and they walked into a strange building that made them nervous when they got in the parking lot and they still walked in and, and they sat around people they didn't know and it made them nervous, but they stayed. And so what they really need is somebody to love them enough to walk up and to just very genuinely welcome them, get to know them. And whenever you're ready, let's eat a meal together. And that's a wonderful time to use that. So I would, my, my, my send offs would be make sure you have time, uh, every week set aside and then look for invitations to fill that time with people that don't know the Lord. And, and anybody can do this, you know, starting today, you know, anybody yes. can do it. And, and it's not hard, and, and it's the best thing you could ever invest your time into. Of anything, it's eternal. It, it keeps us grounded. I mean, think, you're right. It's, it's good for eternity's sake and for the Lord's sake, but even for, is this a stretch? Even for our mental health. That's right. You know, there's so many things in this world that's crazy and you can't control. I was not even thinking about this podcast, but earlier today, I thought, there is so much in my life I can't control. But this afternoon, I'm going to be sitting down and studying the Bible with a couple. And I, and I thought to myself earlier today, I look forward to that time because I can talk about things that are really certain then. Yeah, a lot of peace, a lot of, a lot of good, healthy focus comes out of, of just sharing the gospel. And we, and we can do it, like starting today. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, David, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you. I'm sharing your thoughts and your stories and strategies. Oh, you're welcome. And Tyus, it's great to be with you and I appreciate all that you do. And, and it's exciting to think of even everybody that's joining in, listening, uh, and it amazing how God works all over the world. And there's so much good that takes place that, that we don't know about it on this side, but on the other side, the things we're talking about now, we're going to get to see the result of it. Amen. And, and you, no matter what your age, I like the stories because a lot of people think, oh, I'm too old or I'm too young. Yeah. No matter what your age listening today, you can go and follow Jesus and be a light to the world, just like he asked us to be. So God bless you and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. You've been listening to Be Brave. The world right now is a crazy place, and sharing the love of God is the most important thing we can do right now. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit up GoBeBrave.org. Remember, the love of God is the most powerful force in the universe. Learn how to love like Jesus. See you next time.